Okay, good afternoon. We are going to um, review last semester final. So the first question is um, based on this graph without trade, what is the consumer surplus, okay? So for consumer surplus, what we have to do is we take um, the difference between the willingness to pay, the maximum willingness to pay of the, of the consumer, which is the intercept between the demand function and the y-axis, right? And the equilibrium, and the um, equilibrium price, because this is without trade. So my equilibrium price is here, and it is, it looks like 32. One thing that happened in this, um, with this exam last semester was that the axes were slightly shift, so it was hard to see. If that happens in your exam, the professor is gonna tell you like, to fix that, okay? <coughs> so we have that the intercept, intercept here is 60, Okay, and the equilibrium price is 32. So what is my consumer surplus? Consumer surplus is equal to the price of the demand function minus the equilibrium price times what? The optimal quantities, which in this case are 14. Let me do this better, like this. 14 times optimal quantities in equilibrium divided by 2, okay? So it's this triangle here. Is everyone with me? Okay, so we calculate this and we have 60 minus 32 times 14 divided by 2, okay? What is our answer there? Can you do the calculation for me? 196, okay? Which is C. Okay, um, I have a question. Since you found out the consumer sur uh, surplus, uh, most of the questions had 996. How would you find out which one is correct? Because AM Consumer surplus is AM 196. AMP also has 196. Because you have to calculate it. Okay. So. But the producer surplus for all of them are different. Without trade, the consumer surplus is. Yes. Okay. Oh, I see. You're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, you have to calculate the consumer surplus too, the producer surplus too. So, and the producer surplus is 196 too, okay? You want to, let's make the calculation here. How do you calculate the producer surplus? The same way, right? You find the producer price here, which is 4, the consumer, the um, equilibrium price here, which is 35, so 32, I'm sorry, which it will be 4 minus 32 times the optimal quantities, which are 14, okay, divided by 2, okay? Next. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Yes. For, for the first question again, you got negative 196. I yeah. did negative 196? Yes. 60 minus 32 times 14? No, not for the consumer. You get it for the producer. Okay. Right Is the difference between the Oh, I'm sorry, yes, you're right, is the difference, well, 
is the producer surplus, so it's always positive. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that is the difference between this one and this one, doesn't matter how you calculate it, okay? So in this case is 32 minus 4 times 14, okay, divided by 2, okay? Is that clear? Okay. So, and the next question. With free trade, the country imports. How do we calculate the imports here? First of all, free trade, we have to, our price is going to be the world price now, instead of the price that we have here, okay? So the country imports are the difference between the difference between what the domestic uh, market demands. Here, okay, it's the difference between these quantities of the domestic demand, okay, and what the world price, what the world is, what the domestic supply is offering. Okay, this is how much the country will import. Is that clear? Given this price, this country will produce this much, but will demand this much. So this quantity here are my imports. And that will be 22 are the quantities demanded. Given this price, you find it on the graph and the, and the um, Quantities demanded are, are 22 in this domestic market, and the quantities produced, given this price, are 6, okay? So 22 minus 6 is 16 units. Clear? Okay, so now, do you have a question? Answer is, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, now, the dead weight loss caused by the tariff. How do I calculate the dead weight loss? Okay. So, what is happening here? Before, when I had this world price, okay, The consumers were getting all of this as their consumer surplus, okay? And the producers, the producers were getting this. Now with the tariff, the consumers are getting this, okay? And the Producers, the, um, the producers here are getting this, and this amount here goes to the government. So these two triangles here are my, my dead, weight, dead weight loss, okay? Char the difference, the two triangles, um, of the difference between the world price and the tariff. So, how do I calculate those two triangles? I find the difference in quantities here and the difference in quantities here multiplied by the tariff divide, divided by two and then I add the, the um, area of the two triangles, yes? Um, the new producer surplus, is it from the purple line? down like from 24 to 4 mm -hmm. like the triangle mm -hmm. does it start from the world price or the world price plus the tariff plus the tariff because this because the the producer surplus in there is no tariff for the domestic produ production okay mm -hmm. so they get paid all of this so that's for what they for what they produce that this is the producer surplus the new one with the tariff. The new one with the tariff, okay. yes. Okay. Because there is no tariff for domestic products. So this, this local producer 
is going to get the, the price with the tariff, okay? Usually tariffs, what, what tariffs do? They protect their dom the domestic products, okay? So these two triangles are my dead weight loss. How do I calculate that? The difference between the quantities here times um, the, the, the tariff, which is the um, tariff is 8, okay? And the difference in quantities is 4, okay? Times 4. These, tri these two triangles are the same. So if I do this divided by 2 plus 8, okay, so you can really see this. Plus 8 times 4 divided by 2, one triangle, plus 8 times 4 four divided by two, okay. this is the same as eight times four, that is 32. And the answer is B, okay? So the dead weight loss is these two triangles because this rectangle here is, is what goes to the government, okay? Everyone with me? Okay, so now if the government imposes a price ceiling of 44 in this market, then the total surplus will be. So a ceiling price of 34 is this. My optimal price before was this. What happens with a price ceiling there? What is a price ceiling? You cannot sell at a, at a price that is higher than this, right? But the optimal price is actually lower than this price ceiling. Mm -hmm. So your price, your price ceiling is not binding, right? So you are actually going to sell at the optimal price. Mm -hmm. Therefore, your, <coughs> your total surplus is going to be consumer surplus plus producer surplus, right? And first of all, we calculated in the same in the first question because we calculate both of them. But to do it again, for total surplus, you have the intercept here minus the intercept here. Sorry, the intercept here minus the intercept here. The difference between those two. So it will be 60 minus 4, okay, times the equilibrium quantities, which are 14. Okay, divided by 2, okay? Because it's the area of this triangle here. And if we make that calculation, our answer is A, 392. Okay? Clear? Table one, the following table shows the marginal cost of each of four firms, A, B, C, and D, to eliminate units of pollution from their production processes. For example, firm A to, for firm A to eliminate one unit of pollution, it will cost 46. And, firm a, and for firm A to eliminate a second unit of production, it will cost 103, okay? So my first question, um, based on this table is if the government charge a fee of 99 per unit of pollution, how many units of pollution will, will 
would the firms eliminate together, okay? So this is basically a willingness to pay demand type of example, but where the good is pollution, okay? So how do we find the equilibrium with a willingness to pay? We check what is better for these people. If they get charged $99 per, per unit of production or they, that to produce a unit, to be able to produce a unit of production or if they reduce the, the, the pollution they themselves. It depends on how much it costs to reduce the pollution um, at, at every time. So firm A can reduce the first unit because it's better to pay 46 than 99, right? Same thing with firm B, with firm C, with firm D, and with the second unit for firm C, right? Because for the other um, units, uh, for each firm, it's better to pay 99 and produce pollution. Is everyone with me? So we have that um, the number of units that the firms will, will, will eliminate together are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And my answer is B, okay? So don't get confused by, the, by, by these um, externalities and public goods type because most of them are just based on the same demand, theory, willingness to pay, etc. okay? Okay, now, another question based on this. <laughs> the following table, blah, blah, blah. If the government wanted to reduce pollution from 16 units to six units, which of the following fees per unit of pollution would achieve that goal? Okay. So, what do we have to do here? Let's see. We can check, we can start eliminating units here. So if the government, the, the government starts saying, okay, I don't wanna, I wanna get rid of this one. I wanna check what is the highest price that I can give to these people so they eliminate units, okay? Okay, so let's start, let's look for six units. One, two, three, four. Which one is higher? Five and six, okay? The government wants to eliminate these six units of pollution, okay? So what the government does is to charge, what is the pr a price higher than this, than 173? Okay, which is the highest price for all of this. And it will be 179. Okay? No? Okay, so. Okay, because the government, how did we solve the previous question? Okay, we said, um, oops. We had that these people said, okay, I'm going to eliminate, uh, if the government wanted to reduce pollution from, ah oh no, this is the last one, I'm sorry. Okay. If the government change charges a fee of 99 per unit of pollution, how many units of pollution would the firms eliminate altogether? Okay? Okay. So the government charges 99 and mm, they eliminate one, two, 
3, 4, and 5. Okay? Okay. <laughs> and they produce 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay? The total units, units that these firms produce is 16. So you want to eliminate 6 of them. Okay? You have to eliminate, to start by the ones that are more expensive to, for the firms to produce, okay? So you, you want to go from eliminating, sorry, you want to go for producing, the government wanted to reduce pollution, pollution from 16 units, so this is 16 units of pollution, okay? to six. So what does it do? The, the government wants to, okay, I want to eliminate six units of pollution. And you start for the ones that are more expensive to, expensive to the firm, right? Because if you start for the ones that are cheaper to the firm, the firm will produce those and pay the cost of reducing them, of reducing them themselves. You see? Yes. So the answer is C. Clear? Okay, good. Um, I have a question. How do we get to 100 Oh, because the next, mo the next most, most expensive pri e price is 173, okay? For these firms. So what will be binding for them will be 179, okay? A more expensive one doesn't work. A cheaper one will eliminate more units, okay? Okay, now, Mr. Brooks operates a business in a competitive market. The current market price is, the current market price is 10. The average variable cost is 8 and the average total cost is 10. Okay, oh, sorry, 11. Okay, so what happens here? The price is between, the price is higher than the average variable cost, but is lower than the average total cost. Okay, so this firm is able to produce in the short run because this firm can't cover the variable cost. The variable cost in the short run is what happens every month for this firm, okay? But in the long run, everything is variable. So the average total cost is the, is the, is the, um, is the, aver is the same as the average variable cost, okay? So this firm in the long run will be, ha will be having a price that is, is, that is lower than the, than the cost. So the firm will be losing. So the firm doesn't want to be in the long run in this situation. But in that the firm can be in the short run in this situation because the firm can be can be paying the regular the one the daily basis cost. Okay, so what is going to happen is that the firm will shut down. Um, oh no no no! Continue to operate in the short run because the firm can pay the variable cost, but will exit in the long run because the firm cannot be producing at a loss forever, okay? At a loss forever. Clear? You have to, give me one sec. <laughs> In the book, there are, there, I think there is a table that tells you what happens in the short run when the price is higher than the variable cost, sh um, lower than the variable, than the average variable cost, etc. Memorize that table. You will see that it makes sense, but uh, because you, this type of questions you answer it by, you don't really need to make a bunch of calculation, you just compare this and based on that info, on that, on what is on that table, you can answer those types of questions. Yes? Um, so I have another question about, let's say we switch the price to the average total cost. An example, the price is 11 and the average total cost is 10. So will the answer be that they'll produce in the short run and then exit in the long run? It's not, it's not in the final. Uh, they will, what? They will? 
so, like I'm saying would they would they uh, produce and show an X in the long run? If the price is binding, is is the same? No, I mean they won't be. Um, they will be covering their cost, yeah. but they will they won't be making losses. So it's fine. And remember that in everything that we see here in this class in economics, <coughs> your cost includes the salaries of everyone in the firm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So <coughs> when we are talking about a loss, it's an economics an economic loss. Okay. When it's equal, it's as if it is binding. <coughs> okay. I suppose that the chicken industry in is in the long run equilibrium at a price of five. per pound of chicken and a quantity of 400 million pounds of chicken. Suppose that WebND claims that a bacteria found in chicken will decrease your expected lifespan by six years. In the short run, firms will respond by. So, price, quantity, five years. Five years. Supply, demand. This is my chicken market, okay? I have price of five um, and quantities of 400. This question is stating that this price of five is the long run price, okay? Meaning that this is the price that has to be happening every single year in the history of the chicken industry, basically, okay? So what happens when there is a change in expectations like this one? What happens to demand, the demand function? Right? People don't want to eat chicken because they are going to die five years earlier. So <laughs> it shifts to the left, okay? And we can see that at that, in that short run after that um, report is released, they have to produce less at a lower price, right? But that lower price is not the long run equilibrium price. So they will be making a loss in the long run. In the long run. So what happens here is that they will be producing less chicken because this is what happens in the market, right? And they will be running at a loss. Then what happens? What did we learn in this class? That the forces of the market will make probably either they will release another study that says that um, that chicken is very healthy and you need to eat all that protein, blah, 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 or, the sub or, the, or some firms are gonna exit the market, okay, so that the price goes up. The point is that at in the long run, the, the equilibrium price will go back to five, but in the short run, they say like, okay, it's fine. We can be producing at a loss in the short run, okay? And this is what the equilibrium in the short run looks like. Everyone with me? Okay? Okay. So now question nine. Okay, these type of questions are very easy, but the way they are set up is kind of tricky because you um, you feel that they are not giving you enough information. Okay, so they say, the following table gives information on the price, quantity, and total cost of production of a good. They give you the price, the output, and the total, the price associated with, with each quantity, and the total cost associated with each quantity. Okay, and the question is, the price and quantity that would ar arise in a monopoly market is. So what is it that a monopolist do? maximizes profit, okay? So what we need to do is that based on this table, find the highest profit for this monopolist, and at that point, we found the price and the quantity, okay? A general question, in a, a general um, monopolist does marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, okay? 
then you find the price in the demand function and then you find the quantities, of, oh, sorry, from here you find the quantities of the monopolies and then those quantities you put them in the demand function. But you don't have all the information here. So what do you do? You do, okay, I need to maximize, maximize profits and profits are equal to total revenue minus total cost. And what is total revenue? Total revenue is price times quantities. So I do have all that information here. So the key thing was what? Remember that a monopolist wants to maximize profits, okay? Total revenue is price times quantity. So let's calculate the total revenue here. At a price of five, the, the quantities are zero, so my total revenue is zero. At a price of four, quantities are two, my total revenue is eight. At a price of three, my total revenue is 12. At a price of two, my total revenue is 16. At a price of one, my total revenue is 10. And here is zero, okay? And now my profits are, um, okay, here doesn't matter. Here is six, okay? Total revenue minus total cost. Now again, total revenue minus total cost, nine. Total revenue minus total cost, six. Total revenue minus total cost, two, okay? So what is the price and quantity that maximize profits? Price two, quantity eight, because the highest profits that I can get in this situation are 10. Everyone with me? And so the answer is this one, C. Yeah. Did you say okay. that for um, monopolies, marginal revenue equals marginal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you will you there there are more questions about that um, in this exam, and Bela is gonna go over them. So don't so don't worry. Okay. Now. For oh well, we have we have a question uh, like that here. So suppose a monopolist has a demand curve that is expressed as p equal sixty minus q. The monopolist marginal revenue curve is equal to 60 minus 2Q. Sorry, yeah, 60 minus 2Q. And the monopolist has a constant marginal cost of 20. Refer, uh, the profit maximizing monopolist will have a deadweight loss of. So what do we have to do? A bunch of things. Mm, where can I draw this? Okay. Let's do it here. So we have our marginal cost, okay, that is constant. We have our demand function, we have our marginal revenue, okay? In perfect competition, what will be the price and the, and the, um, and the quantities? Price will be, will be this because price equal to marginal cost, okay? This will be the price, and this will be the quantities, okay? So we have to, f and then in monopoly, what would it be? We find the quantities by making marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, then we plug those quantities into the demand function, and that give us the price of the monopolist, okay? So what happens is that this mono, um, the, um, monopoly, the monopolist behavior is gonna end up in a deadweight loss of this triangle, okay? So we have to find the difference between the quantities of perfect equilibrium and monopoly and the difference in prices and that will give me the height of the triangle, the base of the triangle and then we divide that by two and we find the area of the deadweight loss, okay? So this is basically 
an example in which they want you to maximize uh, to find the optimal price and quantity for the for perfect competition, optimal price and quantity for the monopolist, and then do something with it. Okay? So let's start by finding um, the perfect competition values. Okay? So in perfect competition, marginal cost is equal to price. Okay? So that means that 20 is equal to 60 minus Q, okay? And Q is equal to 40. Am I doing this right? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, and the price then, then is 60 minus Q, which is 40, is equal to 20. So the price of perfect competition and the quantities of perfect competition, okay? Now, for a monopolist, how is this? Marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, okay? The main difference is that in perfect competition, price is also equal to marginal revenue. In monopoly, marginal revenue is smaller than price because the monopolist has a power to have a markup, okay, on the price. Good? Okay, so let's calculate this. 20 equal 60 minus 2Q, okay? This is 2Q is equal to 60 minus 20. Q is equal to 20. Am I doing this right? Right? Okay. So this is the quantity of the monopolist. So we have here. Quantity of the monopolist is 20, quantity of perfect comp competition is 40. And the price here, we put this quantity of the monopolist into the demand function. So that gives us, let's do it here so it can be seen in the video, is give us price equal 60 minus 20, therefore the price of the monopolist is equal to 40. So we have that the price in perfect competition is 20, the price of the monopolist is 40, okay? So we, we have the difference between 20 and 40 is 20, okay? That is the base, times the difference between these two is 20, okay? Divided by 2, okay? Is it clear? So we just combine a bunch of things that you learned this semester. Price and quantities in perfect competition and price and quantities in um, monopoly, okay? And the dead weight loss is the difference between the consumer surplus or the surplus in this case of the, of perfect competition versus the surplus of um, monopoly, clear? And the answer is D, 200, okay? Yeah, because this is um, 400 divided by 2, okay? Good. Any questions? Now, suppose the executives at an art museum know that 200 adults are willing to pay 12 for admission uh, to the museum on a weekday, and they also know that 200 students are willing to pay 8 for admission on a weekday. And the cost of operating the museum on a weekday is 2500 Okay, 
how much profit will the museum earn if it engages in price discrimination? What is price discrimination? You charge every consumer their willingness to pay, basically, okay? As long as you have the information. So what I do is that I charge 200, my question is the profit, and profit is total revenue minus total cost. And total revenue is price times quantities, okay? And total cost, I have it already, which is 2,500. So I need to calculate my total, sorry, total cost, I have it already, which is 2,500, total revenue, price times quantities. First of all, 200 um, people that will pay $12, price tim times quantity, plus 100 people that will pay eight dollars okay and that is 2200 plus sorry 2400 plus 800 is equal sorry minus the total cost which is 2500 that is equal to 700 okay Answer is A. Clear? Good? Okay. There are, there is another question on price discrimination and the main idea is the same. These questions are usually very simple. You just have to try to, as you have seen what I do usually when I read a, pro a problem is that I write down the main pieces of information. That's a key, that's the key I think. Okay, now, next question. Gilda, how do you pronounce Gilda? Gilda, okay. Gilda <laughs> quit her job as a project manager at eBay to start her own fashion designer business. She financed the business by withdrawing money from her personal savings account. When she closed the account, the bank representative mentioned that she would, uh, sorry, that she would have earned six hundred dollars on interest um, next year. If Gilda hadn't opened her own business, she would have earned a salary of fifty-five thousand. Now, in her first year. In her first year, um, her revenue is 60,000. So, what is happening here? Option A, Gilda's total, total explicit costs are 55,600. Um, no, because these 600 and these 5,500 are the opportunity cost, what Gilda was willing to give up to start her, her business. But she didn't really have that money and, 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 and lose it or, pay or use it to pay for something, you know? That's not an explicit cost. It's the implicit cost of leaving her eBay job and going um, solo. So, is not, that is not Gilda's explicit cost. Therefore, this 600 is not, her, is not her total explicit cost either because she also gave up her job, okay? That was paying 55,000. So Gilda's accounting profit, profits exceed her economic profits by 600? No, because this 60,000, is more than, than 55 and, because sorry, the difference is not 600, will be 400. So, the, uh, the Gilda's economic profit is 4,400, okay? Clear? So, why do we say that this is her economic profit? Because these revenues include whatever explicit cost she had to pay to start the business at the beginning of the year and to pay for the rent 
uh, of her um, store, the salaries of her workers or her own salary, etc. And her revenue at the end of the year, including the explicit cost, was this. Then the implicit cost was her op the opportunity cost of giving up her job and taking out her savings, okay? So after paying all her explicit and implicit cost, the uh, 60,000 minus this will end up in the economic profit, which is the total revenue minus the implicit and the explicit co cost, okay? Sorry, the total revenue minus the implicit cost, okay? Because the total revenue is already including the explicit cost. Clear? Okay. Yes? Explicit costs are the, are the, I mean, you cannot, there are many examples for it, but in general is what you actually pay for, okay? The electricity bill of the store, that is an explicit cost. The salary of the cleaning lady that comes and, pl and, and, clean, and clean the store, that is an, an explicit cost. The rent of the store, that is an explicit cost, okay? The implicit costs are things that you could, you gave up for. But you, but you, but you didn't really have on you. Okay, is that clear? There are many more examples in the book about the differences between implicit and explicit cost. But the main thing here is that the implicit cost is also the opportunity cost. It's what you decided to give up to pursue whatever the example is telling. Okay. Okay. Now, this is. This is one of my favorite parts of this class. So, suppose that 100 million people are choosing between two candidates. Between two candidates for president, for president representing two prominent political party, parties, we'll, we will call R and D. The voters are believed to be roughly evenly split between the two candidates, so each candidate gets each candidate gets 50 million. Regardless of who wins, both candidates agree that everyone voting is generally good for the health of the democracy. Each candidate knows that they can change minds of approximately 10 million voters by running a negative campaign advertisement against the other candidate. But the process they will, that, that the process, but in the process they will cause about 2 million voters to become disgusted with the election and not vote. Which of the following outcomes is a result of the natural equilibrium of this ele election? So these game theory questions that have a story can be confusing because you have to set it up, but how you set up a regular natural equilibrium? You make the payoff matrix, okay? You what are the strategies? Either you advertise or you don't advertise. Those are the possible actions that you can do, right? Which is what we in game theory call strategies. So we, you either not advertise or advertise, okay? So this is the strategy of um, candidate one and this is the strategy of candidate two, okay? What now you have to set up the payoff matrix, okay? You have to, to, to think with these numbers, what are the payoffs of these people? In this case, what are, what are the payoffs? The number of votes, right? So we have that if they don't advertise, they each get 50, right? Now what happens? If candidate one or candidate R doesn't advertise, but candidate D advertises, what do we get? This candidate will get, I'm going to write down the numbers and explain them to you. Okay, so first of all, what happens? If this one advertises, this one gets 10 million voters from, from this one, okay? So this one will end up with 60. But in the process, 2 million just, oh, oh, ah, okay. In the process, 2 million just don't vote. So each candidate loses 1 million, basically, right? In the process of one, one candidate advertising. So 
it used to be 40, it used to be 60, now because the, because the voters are disgusted, disgusted is 39 and 59, okay? If this one doesn't advertise, this one gets 39 million vo of, of votes and this, this one gets 59. Now, the other way around, if this one doesn't advertise and this one does, is this one will get 39 and this one will get 59, okay? Now, what else do we have? So we have, ad if they both are advertised, okay? This one will get 10 million from this one, and this one will get 10 million from this one, okay? Because that's what, th what they say, no? So then, but also in the process, in this case, both of them are advertising, so we will lose 4 million of people, right? That is like the tricky part here. So what happens here is that they both will end up with 48 and 48 million, okay? So then you first set up the payoff matrix. Now you have to find the Nash equilibrium. How do you find the Nash equilibrium? And this, I, this is my trick to find a Nash equilibrium and it has worked for my students in the past years. Um, so let's hope you, you use it. First of all, you do. You, how do you tackle this question? You say, okay, let's think about what is, what is, a, Nash, what is a Nash equilibrium? Is that each player does the best they can do given what the other one is doing, right? Okay, so here is, okay, for, from the perspective of player one or player R, whatever. If this one doesn't advertise what is the best thing for him, for him to do or for her to do. Fi either not, adver uh, she doesn't advertise and gets 50 million or she advertises and gets 59. What is the best thing for her to do? Advertise. advertise. So what I do is I circle or draw a line with a color <laughs> under the best, the, the best strategies in each um, part of the matrix. Then, if this one advertises, what is the best thing for this one to do? Either not advertise and get 39 or advertise and get 49, 48. What is the best thing? Advertise. advertise. You draw another line underneath it, okay? Now, from this one's perspective, if this one doesn't advertise, what is the best thing to do? You compare not advertising, getting 50, advertising, getting 59. Advertising. advertising. You draw the line. Now, from, again, from this one perspective, if this one does this, what is the best thing for me to do? Advertising. advertising. Okay? This is an 8 here. And your Nash equilibrium is in the box that has two color lines. Okay? Because it's the point in which they both did the best thing given what the other one was doing. Okay? You will always remember these color lines? Good. Because there is another question with that and we will do it again. So, and that gives me 46, uh, 96 million votes. Okay? What? How did I get it? Yeah, no, I'm talking about the number. That, that part I accept is... is, is like this is a tough question, like setting this up is a tough question. No, I'm talking about the numbers. Yeah, I know, like how did I get this 39 mm -hmm. and how did I get, I, I'm saying that that part of the question is, is tougher, but you want me to explain it again? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so first of all, you get 50-50 if you don't do anything, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you do something, what happens? You were 50-50, okay? If you do something, you will take 10 from this guy. So this guy will be 40 and you will be 60. But in the process, 
two million people don't vote. Okay? So what I did here was saying, okay, let's say that these two million split and don't vote for each candidate, for both of them. Okay? So they, or what you can also do better, let's say that two, mini, two million don't vote for the one that advertises. You have 40 here, 58 here. Okay? Uh, 40 here, 58 here. So what I'm saying here is like, okay, 2 million don't vote for the one that advertises because they said like, I hate this guy, his practice is horrible, he's very um, mean with the other candidate, etc. So that's how I created these payoffs, okay? Because when this one advertises and this one doesn't, this one gets 10, vo 10 million voters on this one and loses two million, okay? Now, again, what happens if they both advertise? They were 50. They were, bo were both 50, okay? Now, this one loses, if they both advertise, this one loses 10 And, gain, and gains 10, right? So ends up with 50 again, right? Same thing with this one. This one loses 10 to this guy, but gains 10 to, to this guy, okay? From this guy. So then what happens? But then the people are very disgusted. Two million are people are disgusted against this candidate and two million are disgusted against this candidate. So each candidate gets 48 million. Is that clear? Good? Okay. And it's clear the drawing, the, the way you do the Nash, you solve the Nash equilibrium? Good. So the answer is C96, okay? Oh, because the total votes, which of the following outcomes is a result of the total vote? 96 million voters participate. So 48 votes for, for this guy, 48 votes for, thi for this guy, you put them together, that's 96, okay? Good. Okay, question 14. Suppose the government imposes a $50 tax on the buyers of automobile tires. The tax would, assuming that neither the demand nor the supply of tires is perfectly elastic or inelastic. What is it that the tax knows? So let's see. Shift the demand curve downward by less than 10, than 50. No, because a ta what a tax does, when you have a tax, you have your demand function, you apply a tax on the demand, your demand shifts exactly the amount of the tax. The demand shifts exactly the amount of the tax. So this one is not the answer, okay? Raise the equilibrium price by 50. No, because this is my equilibrium price. I, uh, I, uh, I um, impose a tax, as a, I, as a government impose a tax. This is the supply price. Guys, okay, then my new, with the, with the tax, I find the quantities here, I find the new price with the tax, the new price is this one. And the difference between the equilibrium price and the new price is less than a tax. Why? Because the producers pay for a little bit of it and the consumers pay for another little bit of it. So the equilibrium price doesn't raise exactly $50. So that's not the answer. Create a 25 burden in each of the buyers and sellers. Neither, why? Because here it says, assuming that neither the demand nor the supply of tars is perfectly inelastic or elastic. So we don't know anything about how these curves look, right? The only thing that we know is what? 
that the demand will go down, that the, the, the quantity supply will go down a little. So it will discourage market activity. Okay? Clear? You look puzzled, no? Good? Okay, excellent. Okay. Okay. Now, this is another question similar to this um, externalities, willingness to pay, etc. So, consider a small town with only three families. The Chen family, the David Shivili family, and the White family. The town does not currently have any street lights, so it is very dark at night. The three families are considering putting in a street lights on Main Street and are trying to determine how many lights to install. The table below shows each family willingness to pay for each street light. Now the question is. Suppose the cost to install each street light is 750. How many street lights should the town install to maximize total surplus from the street light? So what should we do here? We should find the town willingness to pay for each street light, right? What is the town willingness to pay for each street light? adding the willingness to pay of the Chen family, the David Shivili family, and the White family, okay? And that will give us basically their demand function for streetlights. So what we have here is that the willingness to pay, let's write it down here, for the first streetlight, oh, the, the town's willingness to pay for the first streetlight is 1,240, right? This is 900 plus 340, 1,240, okay? Um, for the second light is 1,040, right? If we add up all these three, okay? For the third light is 706. For the fourth light is 410. Boom, stop. What happened? Their willingness to pay is higher than the cost for the first light the second light and the third light. They won't put a fourth light because their willingness to pay for the fourth light is lower than the cost, okay? So how many lights? Three. Excellent. Three lights. Answer, C, okay? Clear? This is again price discrimination. The next question. JetBlue knows that there are two types of travelers, business travelers and vacations. Vacationers. For a particular flight, there are 100 business travelers that pay 600. <coughs> for a ticket while there are 50 vacationers who will pay 300 for a ticket. There are 150 seats, okay, available on the plane. Suppose the cost of JetBlue <coughs> Suppose the cost of JetBlue of providing the flight is 25,000, which includes the cost of the pilots, fl flight attendants, fuel, etc. How much profit will JetBlue earn if it engages in price discrimination? So again, what is, what is it that I have to do? Total revenue minus total cost equal profit. Price discrimination will be charging each person their willingness to pay. So, what is this number and what is this number? 60,000 
okay, and uh, 15,000, okay, 60,000 plus 15,000 minus 20,000 is 75,000 minus 25,000, this is equal to 50,000, okay, so what we did is that this is my total revenue because I'm having quantities times price, okay, minus the total cost, this is the total cost of providing the flight, and the answer is C. Is it clear? Okay, good. You have a question? Okay. Okay. Now, another natural equilibrium question. Let's do it together. <coughs> okay, so below is a game played between two firms, firm A and firm B, operating in the same industry. Each firm must decide how much output to produce this year. The profits for each firm are shown in the table below. Firm A, firm B. Now, the Nash equilibrium in this game is. So, let's do this. From the perspective of firm A, what is the best thing to do if firm B, B produces five? Produce six. Because the payoff of producing six is 18 versus the payoff of producing five, that is 15. Sorry, 16. Remember one thing. One thing. This, q, q equal 5 or q equal 6, q equal 5 or q equal 6, are the strategies or the Nash equilibrium. The numbers here are the payoffs or of doing whatever strategy, okay? If in case you have a, a question where they mention payoffs and strategies, etc., we know where you know what you're talking about. Okay, so the best, the best thing to do is uh, producing six units. If Firm B produces six units, what is the best thing for firm A to do? Six again, okay? Good. If, now from the perspective of firm B, if firm A produces five units, what is the best thing for firm B to do? Five units, uh, six units, five, no, six. 18. The payoff of producing six units is 18, which is higher than the payoff of producing five, which is 16. Okay. If firm A produces six units, what is the best thing for firm B to do? Produce six units. Okay? Right? Because 13 is higher than 12. So the Nash equilibrium in this game is that they both produce six units, which is A, okay? What happened here? You can see that this Nash equilibrium takes us to a situation where, the, where they are worse than here, right? That is the prisoner's dilemma, okay? They could be better if don't if they don't do the if they don't do the Nash the strategic strategic game, but because they have to play strategically, they end up doing this, okay? Which is the best thing they can do given what the other one is doing. Okay? Clear? Good. Okay, now. An increase, this is, uh, okay, I'm sorry, this is, this question 18 is not related to this figure, okay? It has no, nothing, I was like, what? An increase in a unit tax will cause the smallest increase in the price when? Okay, so let's, um, let me do something here. Okay, let's, let's do it here, okay. First of all, 
one like memory tip. When a curb is inelastic, it looks like an eye because it looks like this, okay? When a curb is elastic, it looks like an E, okay? You will all, like, believe me that I am doing a PhD in economics and I still use those graphs that I learned in undergrad. So, inelastic from E looks like an, from, sorry, from inelastic looks like an I, from elastic looks like an E, okay? So the most elastic would look like this, the most inelastic would look, would look like this, okay? So then when you see graphs in a certain way, you remember these two letters. Everyone with me? Okay, good. Now, let's look at this. An increase in a unit tax will cause the smallest increase in the price when? Let's, do Let's do a sort of inelastic supply. Okay. And let's do a very inelastic demand here. Okay. Supply, demand. Supply and look if there is a unit tax, okay? We move this one, okay? And this is the equilibrium price, this is the price increase when they are both. Um, when they are both inelastic. Let's say that my demand is elastic now. Okay? I apply the tax, right? Tax. And then my new price is this one. Price plus tax. Pla price plus tax. Okay? So what we can see here is that when supply is inelastic, okay, the smallest increase in price will happen when? When demand is elastic or when demand is inelastic? Elastic. elastic. We can see it from the graph. How can we think about this theoretically, let's see, or, or intuitively? What is an inelastic demand? that if the price changes a lot, my quantities don't change much because I really need that product. So as a consumer, I'm willing to take, to eat up whatever the increase in price is, okay? And, um, and, keep, and keep, keep consuming, okay? So from, from the equilibrium price up, because the consumer is willing to, to, to eat it up, this increase in price is going to be higher. When your demand is very elastic, you are like, no, 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 if you increase the price, I will, cons I will consume less, okay? So, what a tax does when the demand is very elastic is that the tax, the producers are the ones who have to pay for the tax the most. And the difference in the price between the equilibrium price and the, and the price of the tax is very little for the consumers. You see what I'm talking about? Because the consumer said like, if you increase it that much, even with the tax, I'm going to change my quantities a lot, okay? So they say like, okay, then the increase in the price for a very elastic demand is smaller, okay? We can, um, you want to look at this one, both supply and demand are elastic. If we do that here, we will have supply. Oh, this is not. 
is very difficult to compare it this way because look what happens when they are both elastic is that the difference in price both of them either, uh, so, sorry, both, the supply curve, the, the consumer and the producers have to pay for the difference in prices. So the answer is B from what I showed here at the beginning, okay? Mm, because you have to focus on the demand because the difference in the demand are where, what move the price from the equilibrium up. Okay, the, the changes in the supply, in the elasticity of the supply, move the price down because it's that they are getting less of their, of their um, less from what they are producing than what they were earning before, okay, from the tax. Clear? No? Yes? 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 Okay. Okay, okay, let's do this. Suppose we have two people, jo Jose and Bianca, who initially don't trade with each other. They share a desert island and each can catch fish or cut up local trees. If Jose puts all his time into fish production, so okay, Jose, can you see here? Can everyone see here? Jose um, can make 10 fish if he uses all his day, all his time uh, producing fish, or can uh, produce 10 logs if he puts all his time into log, log production. Okay, now Bianca. Let's do Bianca here, so we can compare those there. Bianca mm. <coughs> If Bianca puts all of her time into fish production, she can produce six fish uh, or 12 logs, right? That's what it says. Six fish, while she can produce 12, lo 12 logs if she puts all of her time into log production. Use these numbers to find her straight line of production possibility curve. So how does this look like for this guy? Fish and logs, and it's just a straight line where <coughs> all the time to produce 10 logs or all the time to produce fish. Therefore, what is the opportunity cost of Jose, uh, what is the opportunity cost of producing fish for Jose? What is opportunity cost? What you have to give up to get something. So he spends his day either producing logs or producing fish. So the, what, when I say opportunity cost is basically the price of a fish in terms of logs or the price of log in terms of fish, right? So. What is the price of a log for Jose? One fish. One log. Price of log is one. And the price of a fish? One fish. And the price of fish is one log. Okay? Now for Bianca. Six, twelve. This is how her production possibility frontier looks like, right? Here is the logs. Here are the logs. Here are the fish. Is okay. So, 
the price of a fish for Bianca is how many loaves? What? Two. Okay? Price of fish is two log. And the price of a log for Bianca is one half fish. Okay? Okay, so the price of a log, 16 fish for Jose? No. For Jose is one fish? Yes. So B works. For Bianca is half a fish? Yes. Right? So C works. So D is B and C are correct. So our answer is D. Okay? Good. Now. Uh, as a consequence of the correct answer in question 19, which was the, the previous question, okay? What would happen? Jose should specialize both in fish and logs. No, because Jose price of uh, fish is cheaper than Bianca's price of a, of a log. Okay, so he should she sh he shouldn't speci specialize in both of them. Bianca should speciali specialize in both fish and, do and logs. No, because Jose is better at producing fish. So, Jose should specialize in fish production and Bianca should specialize in log production, right? Because Bianca's price of producing uh, log is half fish versus Jose that is one, uh, that is one fish and Jose's price of fish is one log versus Bianca that is two log, okay? So you, you, you specialize in the good that you have the best opportunity cost, okay? Or the lowest. So the answer is C, okay? Okay, so let's move on to the second half of the exam, starting with question 21. Okay, so we're asked the following. The profit mocks... Uh, so we're given figure three, a monopoly's demand, marginal revenue, and marginal cost curves are graphed in this diagram here. And we're asked to refer to figure three. The profit maximizing level of output is, so for the monopolist, he's going to want to produce output where marginal revenue is going to be equal to marginal costs. So that's going to amount to follow following the graph and finding the point where the two intersect. Okay, so we have the marginal revenue curve here, we have the marginal cost curve here. So the guy is gonna produce at this point right here. So what's the optimal level of output at this point? 30, so we're measuring this in thousands, so we're gonna have 30,000 bottles per day. So the answer choice is? Questions? Hey. Yeah. It's hard to get used to this. <laughs> okay. So, C. No. 
Oh man, this is really not good. Okay, one sec, guys. We want to go forward, except I'm going backwards. Am I holding it upside down? No, I don't know. When I press up, it should go forward, right? What is this doing? I don't know. Okay, you no. You press the thing is that down goes forward. That's oh, why now it it's was the reverse. That's why I was told you. No, that's why I was telling you it's confusing. Yes. Okay. Down forward. Yes. Down is forward. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So the answer is A. a. <laughs> okay. Twenty-two. Referring to the same diagram. So when this firm maximizes its profit, the dead weight loss is. So how do we find the dead weight loss? Well, dead weight loss is always going to be this little triangle, right? So we said that he's going to be producing here, right? So the dead weight loss is going to be this triangle right here, bounded by that quantity, the intersection of the MC and demand curve, and the height is going to be this thing right here. So we want to calculate the area of this triangle. And if I get a working pen, I'll do that with you. Are there any other pens, Paloma? Excuse me. Are there any other pens? I don't know which one you were using, but none of these work. The green one is working. The green one? Okay, we'll do this. Okay, so we're doing, oh, even better. Thank you, Paloma. So we're doing the area of this triangle, and if you recall, the area of a triangle is just one half base times height, where the base is going to be this distance right here. In other words, 70 minus 40, which is 30. And the height is going to be this distance right here. In other words, 50, which is actually 50,000, minus 30,000. So so we want to calculate the area which is going to be one half thirty wait are the units cents thirty cents times am I doing this right? Yeah, thirty times twenty thousand. Okay. So what is that going to be equal to? Mm hmm Excellent. Three hundred thousand. So your answer choices are in dollars, but this is actually in cents, so there's a typo here. So this is really 300,000 cents or $3,000, okay? So we're going to go with answer choice D, but this should be cents. Questions? Okay, good. Down is forward. Okay. Okay. All right. New figure. Question? So, uh, the, the proposal answer is in dollar. I don't know. You, got, you have to change it over. Yes. No, no, no. So I just said that there's actually a typo here. These should be cents. This is a typo. These should all be oh, cents. Okay. okay. So your answer is 300,000, but it should be cents, not dollars. Okay. Okay? Great. Okay. So now we're referring to a new diagram. The current demand, marginal revenue, and cost curves of Smart Digit Incorporated, a firm supplying calculators in a monopolistically competitive market, has the following diagram. And we're asked, what is the firm's economic profit? So what is the formula for economic profit? We can express profit as total revenue minus total cost, right? The basic formula we always come back to. So in this case, we might actually want to rewrite this formula as P, 
the price, minus the average total cost, times the quantity. Does everybody see how I get from here to here? So basically, if I were to factor out a Q from this expression, well, total revenue is really just the price times the quantity. Total cost is really just, on average, what I'm paying per unit times the number of units. So these two expressions are equivalent. But this one is going to help me because I have numbers for all these in my graph. So now what this amounts to is just finding on the graph the relevant price, average total cost, and quantity. So we're dealing with a monopolistically competitive market. So the guy is going to look at his MC, his MR, find the intersection, and produce there. So he's going to produce at 300 calculators per day. Okay. Now how do we find the relevant price once we have the quantity in the monopoly? We trace back up to the demand curve, follow that point to the y-axis, and we get our price. So we have our first piece of information is going to be 10, a price of 10. Now we're going to do the same thing for the average total cost. So the average total cost, what is the value of average total cost along this line? Well, the point is right here, which corresponds to a value of 8. Excellent. And we said the quantity was going to be 300. So now we just plug and chug. We have 10 minus 8, which is 2, times 300. This is 600. So my economic profit is? Okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, how do we know to choose uh, 300,000 or 300 calculators per day? So remember that a monopolist is going to optimize okay. by setting equal marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. So in this diagram, you don't have to do any math because you have all the curves yeah. and you have all the values. So you just find the point where marginal cost curve intersects the marginal revenue curve. And that's right here. That gives me the quantity. Once I have that, I have everything else. OK? Any other questions? Yeah. Why did you subtract from 8? Why did I subtract from 8 here? So we're trying to find the profit, right? And we said that the profit can be otherwise written as P minus ATC times Q. The price is 10, but I have to subtract from that the ATC. The ATC is 8, because remember, if we go if we look at this line, which is the line of interest, and you find the value of ATC along this line, the value of ATC is 8. So I need to subtract 8. OK? Other questions? All right. So the answer here is B. OK, same diagram. New question. Referring to figure four again, if other firms are facing a similar situation, then in the long term, in the long run, what's going to happen? So what's happening in this situation is basically that firms are making a positive profit. Okay? So is that going to incite new firms to enter the market or not? Enter, right? There's room for making profit. That's going to give people an incentive to now join this market. So we're going to automatically eliminate the answer choices that are leaving the market. We're not leaving, we're entering because there's still positive profits to be made. Now amongst these two choices, we have to, dis we have to choose. So what's going to happen to the price? So I got two different answers. So if new firms are entering the market, what's happening? I have a lot more competition. When the competition goes up, what happens to prices? It drives down prices, right? So the price is going to decrease. So the answer choice is C. Questions? Okay. Okay. A monopolistically competitive firm in the long run. So let's go through these answer choices since we don't really know what to do otherwise. Well, 
is a monopolistically competitive firm going to be inefficient because it makes zero economic profit? Does a monopolistically competitive firm necessarily make zero profits? No, we just had an example where they made $600 profit, so clearly that's not a necessary condition. So we're going to eliminate choice A. What about produces a profit maximizing amount of output that is less than its capacity output? So the capacity output, think of that as what would have been produced in a perfect competition world. So does a monopolist produce less than what he could have done in a perfect competition? Yes. yes. So is this true or not? It's true. So we know we found our answer. But if we had been a little confused, we could have still moved on to choice C and said, well, this one again says that there's zero economic profit. That's not necessarily true. So that's not going to be the answer choice. And it follows that neither D is going to be the answer choice from that. OK, so our answer is B. Questions? OK. 26. All right, suppose that when two units of labor are hired, the total cost of production is $85. So for two units of labor, total costs are 85. Now, if I have an additional unit of labor, in other words, if I have three units of labor, then the total cost of production is 120. What is the marginal cost of the third laborer? So, so the marginal cost of the third labor is basi basically going to be the change in the total cost divided by the change in the additional unit of inputs, right, which is labor in this, in this case. So the change in total cost is going to be what? I heard somebody say it earlier. Okay, which is? Excellent. So it's 120 minus 85, which you've already told us is going to be 35, so that's very good. The change in quantity, well, we're going from two laborers to now three laborers, so that's the change of one. one. So our marginal cost is going to be 35. Okay? Does everybody follow how we got this? Okay. So answer choice is B. Questions? Okay. At Burt's Bootery, the total cost of producing 20 pairs of boots is 200. So this is going to be a similar type of question. We have, if we produce a quantity of 20 pairs of boots, the total cost is $200. Okay? Now, we're not told about the total costs for the 20 for producing 21 pairs of boots, but we're told that the marginal cost of producing the 21st pair is equal to 73. So, so if we look at the answer choices to know that, to sort of get an idea of which direction we should go in and what we should be calculating, we see that we're talking about marginal costs, average total costs, and average variable costs. So marginal cost of the 20th pair of boot is $20. Well, we don't necessarily know that, OK? And average total cost shows up twice. So I'm going to go with a gut feeling, and I'm going to look at what average total cost is. Okay? And we're talking about average total cost for 21 pairs. So let's calculate that. So to get the average total cost of the 21 pairs, we can work backwards. We know that the marginal cost is equal to the change in the total cost divided by the change in quantity. In other words, if we call x 
the total cost of producing 21 boots, so we're doing some algebra here, so let x be the total cost of producing 21 boots, okay? Then the change in total cost should be x minus the total cost of producing 20 pairs of boots, which is 200, over the change in quantity, so we went from producing 20 boots to 21 boots, so the change is 1. Well, we know that this expression should equal to 73. So we can work backwards to get the total cost of producing 21 boots. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So this just amounts to solving the algebraic expression, x minus 200 equals to, is it 73 or 75? No, 73. 73. Okay, I did the math with 75, so my math might be a little wrong, but okay. Um, x minus, oh no, it actually resolves in the end, never mind. x minus 200 equals to 73, so x equals to 273. So x, remember, is the total cost of producing 21 pairs of boots. And we're curious about the average total cost. So if we want to go from total cost to average total cost, what do we do? Excellent. So we're going to divide by the quantity. So we're going to divide 273 by how many pairs of boots are we dealing with? 21. So that means that the average total cost is going to be equal to, if you punch this into your calculator, it should be approximately equal to 13, very good. And that makes the answer choice B. Good job. Okay. Does everybody follow how we did that? Questions? Okay. Good. Okay. Is it cutting off more than that? Question 28. No, it's fine. Suppose that a firm in a competitive market faces the following prices and costs. Thank you. Thank you. If the firm is producing two units, of output, in other words, if the firm is here, well, what's going on? And we have a few answer choices to choose from. So let's see. The answer choices, if you just look at them very quickly, every one of them seems to be referring to marginal revenue and marginal costs, right? Marginal revenue, marginal costs, and so on and so forth. So we know that we want to somehow get to a marginal revenue and a marginal cost so that we can evaluate each of these statements and choose the correct one. What's the marginal revenue in this setup? We're producing at two. What's the marginal revenue? Well, the marginal revenue is the additional revenue that I get for another good, for another unit of good, of the good, which is basically the price, right? I make one more unit, I sell one more unit. What's the marginal revenue? Well, the price that I get from that unit. So the marginal revenue is going to be $4. So we got that piece of information. But now we need to find the marginal costs. So we have total costs. How do we find marginal costs? Well, we've used this formula a couple of times so far in the past few questions. Remember, marginal cost is equal to the change in the total cost divided by the change in quantity. So when we sell two outputs, we're moving from one to two. So what was the change in total cost? We went from eight to, we went from five to eight. So the change is eight minus five, which is three. And the change in quantity going from one to two is one. So our marginal cost is three. So now we're comparing a marginal revenue of 4 with a marginal cost of 3. 
Now, all of these answer choices are going to ask us about whether we should produce more or less. Before we look at these, each of these answers, let's reason through it. Your marginal revenue is four. It's greater than your marginal cost, which is only three. Do you keep producing or do you produce less? Keep producing. Why? Because your marginal revenue is more than your cost. So? You, you have more room to grow, right? Optimally, you want marginal revenue to equal to marginal cost, mm -hmm. right? That's where, that's where the system equalizes, where you're not better off producing one more and you're not better off producing one less. So if your marginal revenue is still greater than your marginal cost, you still have some more room where you could still extract a little bit more and sell a little bit more, okay? So we're going to want to produce more. So which answer choices can we automatically eliminate? Yeah. So B and D. And now let's look at these. So produce more units of output because marginal revenue is less than marginal cost. Well, that's exactly the opposite, right? So it's not going to be A. We go to C. Marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. And that's exactly right. Are there questions about this one? Yeah. Uh, why is marginal revenue four dollars again? So remember, marginal revenue is the additional revenue you're getting for an additional unit sold. Well, if I sell one more unit, how much money do I get for it? Price. The price that I sold it for. Okay. So the price is the marginal revenue. Okay? okay. Is there yeah. Any other questions about this one? It doesn't change because the price is four. All the right. Way down. Right. Price yes. So the marginal revenue is always the price, no matter what. The marginal. In a competitive market, yeah, that's that's where the optimal point is going to be, right? We want marginal revenue equals marginal cost equals to P. Okay. Other questions about this one? Okay. Great. So answer choice was C. Okay, question 29. So the information in the table below shows the total demand for premium channel digital cable TV subscriptions in a small urban market. So assume that each digital cable TV operator pays a fixed cost of 200000 per year to provide premium digital channels in the market area and at the marginal cost of producing, of, pro of providing the premium channel service to a household is zero. Okay, so we're dealing with we're dealing with something that looks like a monopoly, right? We have two people, two companies providing this digital cable, all right? So for the sake of answering the question, let's treat them as one individual. Think of them as partners in a firm. Just think of them as a single entity, OK? There's no other competition. And together, what they want to do is they want to maximize profits, right? just like any other firm. So assume there are two digital cable TV companies operating in this market. If they're able to collude on the quantity of subscriptions that will be sold and on the price that will be charged for subscriptions, then their agreement will stipulate that we want to know we want to solve the number of subscriptions that each firm is going to sell and the price at which they're going to sell that. So this is basically going back to the simple kind of framework where we're trying to solve for the optimal quantity and the optimal price given these conditions. So we know we have quantity and price and we know that the guys want to maximize profit. And again, profit can always be written as total revenue, which is the same thing as P times P times Q, excellent, minus total cost, which in this case we're told is 200,000 per year. So if I want to maximize profits in the system, I simply need to figure out what's the profit for each of these scenarios, for this quantity, that quantity, that quantity, and so on and so forth, and then just find the greatest of these. Okay? So let's do that. 
So we're looking for, we're going to solve in this column, we're looking for total profit equals to P times Q minus 200,000. Okay? So in this first row, 0 times 180 is going to be 0. Okay? And in the last row, it's going to be 0 as well. No need to solve that one. So 3,000 times 150 is going to be 450,000. And from that, recall, we have to subtract total costs of 200,000. So that's going to be our profit. And we can go on for the next options. And you can calculate this in your calculators with me as we go. So 6,000 times 120, that's going to be 720,000 minus 200,000. Next, we're going to have 810,000 minus 200,000. And the following one is going to be, again, 720 minus 200,000. And finally, we have 450 minus 200,000. So we want to maximize profits. Where are we going to produce? Which of these is the greatest? We're subtracting the same thing each time. So we're just looking here, really. Right? So, so the greatest of these numbers is clearly going to be 810 minus 200,000. So we're going to want to produce here. We're going to want to produce 9,000 at a price of 90. Now, we treated these two guys as a single entity because there's no other competition in this market, but really they're going to be splitting that production. So if they split this production in half, each firm is going to produce how much? Yeah, 4,500, right? 9,000 is going to be the total output. Each will produce 4,500 at a price of? 90, right? So which answer choice is that? So each firm will charge a price of 90. That's correct. So we can eliminate these two. The prices are wrong. Now, each firm will sell 4,500. So choice A. Questions about this one? We're good? Okay, question 30. Suppose the demand schedule for green energy drinks is PD equals to 50 minus 3QD. So that's our demand curve. And the supply is represented by PS equals to 5 plus 2QS. So that's our supply curve. The price is in dollars per case of green energy drinks, and quantity is in thousands of cases. So if the market of green energy drinks is perfectly competitive and there are no externalities, what is the total surplus in the market? So to get total surplus, we're going to want to be able to see this graphically. So let's begin by graphing this diagram. All right, so we have quantity, price, we have a demand curve, which is given by PD equals to 50 minus 3QD. And we have a supply curve, which is given by PS equals to 5 plus 2QS. And we want to find the total surplus in the market. So the total, total surplus is what? Total surplus is going to be the consumer surplus plus the producer surplus. Right? And in this very simple diagram, that's simply going to be the shaded triangle, right? bounded by the supply and demand curves. So let's calculate the area of this triangle. Well, the base is ranging from this value to this value. And the height of the triangle ranges from here to here. So let's start by calculating the height. Okay. How do we find the height of this triangle? Well, we need to know what this point here is. And this point here is, is none other than the intersection of the supply and the demand. Right? That's our optimal quantity. 
So let's solve for optimal quantity. How do we solve for optimal quantity? We set, each, we set both equations equal to each other. That way we get that intersection point. So if we set the demand equal to the supply, we get 5 plus 2q equals to 50 minus 3q, right? And so that gives us, if we add 3q to both sides, that gives us 5q, right, plus 3q, plus 3q. If we subtract 5 from each side, that gives us 45, right? Divide by 5, that gives us that q is equal to 9. And since this is measured in 1,000, this is really going to be 9,000 units. Okay, so I have Q equals 9 for my graph. So we're going to just put in the 1,000 because it's representing thousands of units. Okay, we're going to use that in the actual calculation. So we have the height of the triangle. Uh, yeah, the height of the triangle. Now we need to find the base. And we said the base was bounded by this point and this point. Now, this point is none other than the y-intercept from the demand curve. So this is just BD, the y-intercept from the demand curve. This point right here is just the y-intercept of the supply curve. So what is the y-intercept in the demand curve? It's 50. And this y-intercept from the supply curve? It's just 5. So we're ready to calculate the area of our triangle. So the total surplus is going to be equal to 1 half times, remember the base, so that's 50 minus 5, right? That's this distance right here this point minus that point, times the height of the triangle, which is this distance right here. In other words, 9,000. So we're calculating 1 half times 45 times 9,000. If you punch this into your calculator, you should get, excellent, 202,500. Okay, which is answer choice. Let's see. Questions about this? Are we all good with this one? Okay. So suppose the demand schedule for green energy. Oh, so we said, okay. So now we're dealing with a new scenario. It's the same scenario, but we're tweaking it a little bit. Suppose a company called Slurm bought all of the other competitors and was therefore the only supplier of green energy drinks. So now we're going to a monopoly framework. Demand is the same, so we're still facing the same demand curve, and Slurm has the following marginal cost curve, MC equals to 5 plus 2Q. What quantity will Slurm produce and what price will it charge? So we're tweaking the scenario. We now have a monopoly. So our diagram is going to tweak a little. So dealing with quantity, price, we still have the same demand curve. But remember, the monopolist is setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So we need to graph those curves as well. So the marginal revenue is going to look something like this. And we're going to calculate the actual equation in just a minute. And the marginal cost curve is going to look something like this, for which we already have the equation equals to 5 plus 2q. Okay? So what quantity will Slurm produce and what price will change? Will, will it charge? So before we get the marginal revenue curve, just a preview of what we're doing. We want, again, to find optimal price, optimal quantity. We're dealing with a monopolist. To find his optimal price and quantity, the monopolist sets marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, finds that point of intersection. That tells him how much to produce. That gives him a Q star. Okay? <laughs> now, once he has the Q star, 
he traces back up to the original demand curve and says, well, I'm going to charge you that price. Why? Because I can. So this is going to be the final answer. We just need to plug in numbers now. Okay. So how do we get marginal revenue? Well, we're going to want to work from the total revenue curve. And to get the total revenue curve, we're going to need to work from the demand curve. So the demand curve is 50 minus 3Q. Total revenue curve is simply the demand curve times Q, right? PQ is total revenue. So we're going to multiply this entire thing by Q. So total revenue is PQ equals to 50Q, good, minus, good, 3Q squared. And now I'm going to get the marginal revenue from the total revenue cost curve. You could just set equal, whatever. It doesn't matter. Marginal revenue. So if you've taken intro to calculus, you know that you could take a first derivative to get the marginal revenue of the total revenue. If you don't need to know that for this class, you could just remember that you always just take the number without the Q for this term. So it's going to be 50. And then for the second term, where you have the, the square term, you just multiply the coefficient by 2, so you get a 6. And then you just drop that exponent on the Q. OK? So that's what you have to remember. Fair enough? OK. So we have our marginal revenue curve. Beautiful. Now all we need to do is set this marginal revenue curve equal to the marginal cost curve, and then we're home free. OK. So marginal revenue is 50 minus 6Q. Let's set MC equals to MR. So we have 5 plus 2Q equals to 50 minus 6Q. Very good. Get all the Qs on one side. Plus 6Q plus 6Q. That gives me 8Q. Get the numbers on the other side, subtract 5, subtract 5. AQ equals to 45. Therefore, optimal Q is, it's 5.625. And because we're measuring this in thousands, this 5.625 is really 5,625, right? And that's our Q star. So we have the optimal quantity. So actually, we'll, we're going to need to solve the price for the next question, but we could have just answered the question already because there's only one answer that tells me 5625 in quantity. But let's do the price anyway because we need it for the next question. OK, so how do we get the price? Are we all good with quantity? OK, so how do we get the price from the quantity? What did we say? Uh, so we're going to want to trace up to the demand curve. And for that quantity, find the price in the demand curve. So we basically just take the quantity that we calculated and plug it into the demand curve. Okay, graphically, if you have this nice situation in front of you, you could just trace up and say, oh, hey, I'm right here. Okay? So if I'm taking the quantity 5625 and I'm plugging that into my demand curve, what was my demand curve? Fifty minus three Q, so we're finding P here, so finding P star here. So Q star is five point six two five. We're going to stick with that to plug it back into the equation for the graph. So demand was P equals to fifty minus three Q. We're plugging in Q equals to five point six two five. If we solve this, we get. P star equals 2. You should get something about 33.13 for the price, OK? Which is exactly what we have here, which we knew we would get since that was the answer choice. Questions about this? 
You good? Okay. All right, still dealing with the same scenario. So, uh, what is the difference in total surplus between the perfectly competitive scenario and the monopoly scenario in the market for green energy drinks. Assume no externalities. Oh, I could have kept that. Meh, whatever. Okay. I'm going to have to redraw this. It's okay. All right. So we have our monopoly situation, our demand curve, marginal revenue curve, marginal cost curve. Um, we have equations for all these things. And now we're asked to calculate the change in the total surplus. So the change in the total surplus is going to be what? Yeah, but theoretically, if you think about that, what is that going to be? Remember, the competitive equilibrium, our total surplus, was just this whole thing, right? Because Q and P were here. So this was the entire surplus. But now that we went to the monopoly framework, the monopolist can still charge this price while he's still producing much less, right? He's producing here. So the total surplus shrinks. And in fact, it shrinks by this much. Exactly. So the change in the total surplus is just going to be the deadweight loss. So if I calculate the deadweight loss, I have my answer. That's the change. Follow the logic? The difference between the total surplus in the competitive case and the total surplus in the monopoly case is just that little triangle. Because instead of being here, I'm now here, right? And I'm losing all of this. OK? So I need to calculate the deadweight loss. So how do we do that? So the deadweight loss, again, is going to be this triangle, one half base times height. So we need to calculate the base and the height. So the base is bounded by this point and this point, which if you recall, I wish I had kept the previous diagram, but I'll draw it out again. This point here was, was the price, right? So let me work backwards. So this was where MC equals MR. That's where he's producing. Q equals to uh, 5.625. That's where he's producing. We got the price by moving upwards to the demand curve, where the price we said was 33.13. Right? That was P star. OK? So that's one of my relevant points. The other relevant point is the point right here, which bounds the other side of my base for my triangle. So I need to calculate that piece. This point is really just the intersection of which curves? Marginal cost and marginal revenue. So I need to just find the relevant P where MC equals MR. I have the Q already, so I'm just going to plug it in. So um, what was MR again? Who remembers what MR was? Or MC? MR is 50 minus 6Q. So I know that Q is 5.625. So if I want to find the P at that point, um, so P is equal to, yeah, I'm substituting. So what do I get? I should have it in front of me. Hold on. Good. So I'm substituting the Q inside the equation for P. So P equals to 50 minus 6 times 5.625, which, if you calculate that, turns out to be um, 16.25. Excellent. Thank you. OK. So that's the other bound for that base. So 16.25. So my base is now this minus this. It's this distance right here. Okay? 33.13 minus 16.25. Okay? So, one half base. Base is 33.13 minus 
16.25. Now let's find the height. So the height of the triangle is this distance right here, which we know is bounded by 5.625 on this end, right? That was the optimal quantity. But we want to find the bound here. So what's this point? This point is the intersection of MC and D. So we need to find the intersection of MC and the demand curve. So MC was equal to 5 plus 2Q. So I'm going to set MC equals to PD. So 5 plus 2Q equals to 50 minus 3Q, right? So I'm going to move my Qs over to one side, add 3Q, add 3Q. That gives me 5Q, subtract the numbers to get them all on one side, minus 5, minus 5 equals to 45. So Q is equal to, sorry, divided by 5, not Q. So 45 minus, uh, divided by 5 is 9, which is really 9,000. So effectively, my height is really 9,000 minus 5,625, right? Good. So 9,000. 9,000 minus 5,625. So after having done all this work, if I punch in these numbers, and carry it through, what do I get? So when I actually did this, I got 27, 421. Did you actually get 28, whatever you said? Yeah. You got exactly that? Were you rounding when you did it? No, I got it. Were you rounding along the way? Like, did you no. round 5, 6, two, 5 or anything? Mm hmm, OK. So I got 4. 27421. A couple of us did this together and we were like looking at the answer choices and said, well, it's not here. If you got 28, well, the answer choice officially is supposed to be this one. This is how you do it. That's the number that I get. Maybe I rounded wrong somewhere along the line. Okay? Are there questions on how this is done? Yeah, Can't hear you. That's what you get? Exactly. Awesome, great. You got it this time? Did you get it, Paloma? I got, I got Same thing, right? Oh, I guess. Maybe we were rounding wrong. I don't know. Okay, I'm glad to hear that the answer is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 28485. I'm happy to hear. We must have rounded. Okay, good news. Questions about how to do this? Any question about the logic, how we went through this? We're all good on this. Yeah? OK. It's a little involved, but it, there are just many steps. At the end, they're all the same things you've been doing, and it gets you there. OK. So answer choice C. Good. All right, last question for this scenario. Question 33. Suppose Slurm is able to perfectly price discriminate. I'm not going to erase this. Now that it's perfectly price discriminating, how many cases would the company produce and what would producer surplus be? So the key here is that if the monopolist can price discriminate, he's basically going to end up producing the same exact output as he would have or as would have been produced in the perfectly competitive scenario. Which was basically the first question we had. Right? Going back to question 30, we had the perfectly competitive market with that demand and supply intersection. And we had a quantity. What was that quantity? Nine. That quantity was 9,000. So rule to remember, when the monopolist price discriminates, he's going to produce the same thing that would have been produced in the perfectly competitive scenario. So in the perfectly competitive scenario, which we solved in question number 30, the optimal output was 9,000. That's not going to change. That's exactly going to be the optimal output in this problem. Yes? Conceptually speaking, why would it not be 
what the monopolists would be doing under a monopoly. Because if you think about it, when you price discriminate, you're trying to maximize profit, aren't you? You're not trying to. Yeah. No? No, you are trying to maximize profit, yeah. So wouldn't it be under uh, how much, whatever amount you're making under a monopoly and not under a perfect competition? No. Mm. Uh, Go ahead. And then you will speak for me. Because <laughs> when you price discriminate, you charge every person their willingness to pay. Okay. So you are eating up their consumer surplus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like, so you are making even more than you could make in monopoly. You see? Yeah. Because in monopoly, there is a still a little consumer surplus. Here, no. no. Here, you take you take everything from the consumers when you price discriminate. Okay? Yeah, I got it. So that helps us for the second part, actually. Okay, so the first portion that you should remember is that in the price discrimination situation, when the monopolist is price discriminating, the optimal quantity is going to be the same optimal quantity as would have been in the perfectly competitive case. And the second part is that what happens to producer surplus and consumer surplus? Well, when the monopolist is price discriminating, he's basically extracting every possible thing from the consumer. He's charging each guy exactly what he's willing to pay. So there's no consumer surplus left over. So the producer surplus is the same thing as the total surplus. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to problem 30, we actually have all the numbers we need. We calculated the total surplus in question 30, and it was it was 202,500. And previously, that was consumer surplus and producer surplus. But now, in this scenario, there's no more consumer surplus. Because the monopolist is extracting everything. He's charging everybody his willingness to pay. So the producer surplus is equal to the total surplus, which is 202,500. So the answer choice for this one is D. Does everybody see how we did this? Questions? OK. All right, almost done, guys. All right, moving on to a new scenario. So Wayne values the right to smoke in his apartment at $200 per week. His roommate, Marshall, values a smoke-free air in his apartment at $300 per week. According to the Coase theorem, if Marshall has the right to smoke free to a smoke-free apartment, what is likely to happen? So what does the Coase theorem tell us? Well, the Coase theorem tells us that if we can assign property rights and we have negligible, negligible costs to negotiation, the two guys can basically negotiate between themselves and come out with an optimal, efficient outcome without any intervention, right? So Wayne wants to smoke. Marshall doesn't like smoke. He wants a smoke-free apartment. But the property rights seem to be long to Marshall. He has a right to live in a smoke-free apartment. So if Wayne wants to smoke, he has to pay Marshall. How much? Well, he has to pay Marshall at least $300 so that Marshall's like, well, OK, you can smoke. But the issue is that Wayne actually only values smoking at $200. So if he has to pay Marshall more than $300 to be able to smoke, he's like, forget it. I don't care. I'll go smoke outside. It's not worth it. So what's going to happen? Is Wayne going to give Marshall anything? No. no. Is anybody going to end up smoking in that apartment? No. no. So what's the answer choice? C. Well, C, the apartment will be smoke-free and Marshall will pay. So we're not paying anybody anything. So the answer choice is going to be D. D. So we're going to be living in a smoke-free apartment and no money will change hands. Are there questions about this one? Yes? Why don't they pay C? So Marshall is not paying Wayne anything. Marshall doesn't need to pay Wayne anything. Wayne is the annoying guy who wants to smoke. And Marshall has a right to live in this apartment without any smoke. So if, Mar if Wayne wants to smoke, he needs to pay Marshall. Okay. He's the one producing the externality, oh. right? But in this case, he doesn't, it's not worth it for him because he only values it at 200, right? Is that clear? Questions about this one? 
Marshall values it at 300, um, he would be willing to pay Wayne less than 300 to not smoke in the apartment, wouldn't he? But he doesn't need to pay Wayne anything. He has the right to live in a smoke-free apartment. He doesn't need to pay anything. No. No. According to the code, the okay, Marshall has the right to a smoke-free apartment. So the rights in this case are Marshall's. Oh, okay, right. right, you're living in a building, you have a roommate, you have a right to live in a smoke-free apartment. Now, if your roommate wants to smoke, that's not, that's not okay. Like, you need to arrange that between yourselves. You have the right to live without that pollution in your air, right? You don't need to get sick because of some moron who wants to smoke. So, if you want to smoke, you got to pay the guy who doesn't want you to smoke. But in this case, he's not going to because it's not worth it for him. He doesn't care too much about smoking. Or he cares less about it than the guy values the smoke-free apartment. Okay? Quest any more questions about this one? Okay. So this is choice D. 35. A competitive firm cannot affect its own output price because... So a competitive firm is in a market with a ton of other firms, right? So he doesn't actually have the power to change his price. If he changes the price, let's say he raises his price, everybody else is going to go elsewhere. There's tons of other people selling the same thing that he's selling. He doesn't <coughs> have any power to change the price. So in a competitive market, firms are what we call price takers. They don't set the price. So a competitive firm cannot affect its own apple price because which answer choice is it going to be? Well, A, price is determined by consumers, not producers. It's not determined by consumers, it's determined by the market, market. right? So that's not going to be A. We don't know anything about the elasticity of demand. So it looks like it's going to be C. It is only one firm among many. So the price is determined in the market as a whole, right? It's not D either. Why? Yeah, it's not about consumer preferences only, right? It's determined by the entire market. There's a system at play. Okay. Questions about this one? All right. Listed in the table are the long run total costs for three different firms. Refer to table six, which firm is experiencing constant returns to scale? So what are constant returns to scale? So basically a firm is experiencing constant returns to scale if, while it keeps producing, the average total cost remains the same. Is that correct? Yeah. The average total cost is constant. So let's calculate the average total cost for these firms, for the different quantities. So let's start with firm X. So I'm going to calculate average total cost for firm X. And let's see what we get. So average total cost is going to be total cost. These numbers are all total cost. So it's going to be total cost divided by quantity. So in this case, we, are, we have a total cost of 100. We have a quantity of 1. So the average total cost is 100 divided by 1, which is 100. Now, when he's producing 2, he has a total cost of 200. So what's the average total cost here? Yeah, 200 divided by 2, it's still 100. Next, 300 divided by 3, it's still 100. And 400 divided by 4, it's 100. And 500 divided by 5, sure enough, 100. Does this firm face constant returns to scale? Yes, it does. Now, let's be clever. Do we need to do the rest of these? No. If you were to actually find that the firm X was not constant returns to scale, you could go on. But in this case, it doesn't seem to be worthwhile, so we move on. Questions about this one? So the key was that we looked for a constant average total cost, and we found it upon our first try, so we got lucky. Okay? All right. Okay, 37. Damien crafts and sells fruit flavored hard cider as a part time job. 
She can bottle and sell three cases in a week. She's considering hiring her friend Kurt to help her. Together, Damien and Kurt can bottle and sell seven cases per week. What is Kurt's marginal product? So what is the marginal product? The marginal product, yeah? Produced by an additional unit of input. That's yeah. exactly right. So the marginal product is basically the additional output that's produced by one more unit of input. In this case, we're dealing with labor. So you add one additional guy to the team, how much more do you produce? That's the marginal product. So this question is very simple. Well, Damien's producing a loan. When she's producing a loan, she produces three cases. When she adds her friend, in other words, when she now increases labor by one unit, the two people, she now produces seven cases a week. So what's the marginal product? Seven minus three. That's the additional output produced by that one additional person she added to the team. So the marginal product that Kurt contributes is four cases. Questions about this? Okay. All right. Three more questions, guys. 38. All of the following will shift the supply of oranges to the right except. So let's go through these and see <coughs> which of these will not shift the supply of oranges to the left. To the right. Sorry. So a decrease in the wages of workers employed to pick oranges. So if it helps you, we could actually draw this um, supply and demand framework for the oranges. So we have our supply curve, our demand curve, and presumably we're producing somewhere here. This is what we're producing for oranges. OK. So a decrease in the wages of workers employed to pick oranges. So suddenly, it costs you less to pay the guys who are picking the oranges. That's effectively a decrease in the cost of production. So what happens to my supply curve if my cost of production goes down? What happens to supply? It shifts outwards. It shifts to the right. OK, so that is not the answer. Next, suppliers' expectations that the price of oranges will be lower in the future. So let's think through this. So suppliers expect that the price of oranges will be lower in the future. So what's going to happen to supply? Why? Now. 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 Well, what's going to happen now to the, to the supply of oranges? Because in the future, the price will be lower. If you think that it's going to be lower in the future, you're going to want to get rid of your stock. Because it's not going to be worth as much. OK, so what's happening to supply? No. We're moving right. So you're a firm, right? You want to produce a, s a certain level of oranges. You want to make a certain amount of money. The price of oranges is going to go down soon enough. So if you want to keep doing as well as you've been doing, you're going to have to start making more oranges. OK? So supply is shifting outwards. So that's, again, a shift to the right. Does that make sense? Yeah, a little bit. But I'm kind of seeing it from both ways. Like You can also say that, like, you're going to want to get rid of uh, what you have because you know it's going to be worth less in the future. Well, if he wants to get rid of what he has, he's going to want to increase his supply, right? He's going to want to produce more. Well, no, actually, that's not what I meant to say. If he... You so you're saying... If it's going to be worth less in the future, you're going to want to get rid of it. What happens is that if he's... If the supply, the market is in competitive, if it's in equilibrium, yeah. there is no left, you know, they are selling whatever the market is selling, is selling them. They are, like, all the things that you're saying is that basically they have some inventory. If they have some inventory and get rid of, the, of it, is that they are adding something to the supply, right? Mm -hmm. So that we'll be moving it to the right, no? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like you say, if you stop supplying, you're just going out of business. So is it worth it to go out of business, or is it just, are you just going to, see if it's still optimal for you to produce, just making more so that you can make the same amount of money you did before. Yeah? OK. So it's not going to be B. Next, a decrease in the price of fertilizers used by orange suppliers. So a decrease in the price of fertilizers 
is a decrease in the costs of producing oranges. So if it's less expensive to produce oranges, what happens to my supply curve? It's going to shift right. So again, not choice C. D, an increase in the price of apples is substitute good. So the price of apples goes up. The price of apples goes up. Does that affect my supply? What does it affect? Demand. Demand. So this one is clearly not going to move my supply curve to the right, just like the other ones will. So that's the black sheep in the group. So we're going to select that one. Questions about this one? Okay. Thirty-nine. Which of the following events would unambiguously cause a decrease in the equilibrium price of hamburgers? So here's how I did this one. All your answer choices, if you take a look, are asking you for something that has to do with either hot dogs, the price of hot dogs, and the price of beef. So let's go with the price of beef first because it's the most obvious one. So beef is clearly an input in the production of hamburgers, right? So if the price of beef, if, sorry, if we want a decrease in the price of hamburgers, what does that mean about the price of the beef? Does the price of the beef go up or down? So to get the price of hamburgers to go down, the price of the beef, which is an input in the production of hamburgers, is that going to go up or down? Yeah, right? So if it's cheaper to make hamburgers, I can now sell them for cheaper. If the beef was more expensive, I clearly wouldn't be selling my hamburgers for less. That wouldn't make any sense. So I want the price of beef to be a decrease. So anywhere that I see an increase, I can get rid of those answer choices. So I eliminate A and D. Now let's consider B and C. OK, so let's try B. So B tells me the following. Let's say I have my supply and demand framework. Q, P, here's my initial supply, my initial demand. And I now have an increase in the price of hot dogs. So an increase in the price of hot dogs. Hot dogs is a substitute for hamburgers. So if the price of hot dogs goes up, what happens to demand for hot dogs? Go down. Goes down, right? It's more expensive to buy hot dogs, fewer people want hot dogs. <coughs> When the demand for hot dogs goes down, what happens to the demand for hamburgers? It goes up, right? They're substitutes. H hot dogs are too expensive. I'll buy a hamburger. So demand for hamburgers shifts right. right, shifts outward. So I'm shifting it to D prime. Now, if the price of beef is decreasing, it's now cheaper to make beef, to make hamburgers. So my supply curve for hamburgers is going to shift Right or left? To the right. To the right. It's cheaper to make hamburgers. I can make more hamburgers. Supply shifts outwards. OK? So I went from the intersection at SD to the intersection at S prime D prime, which looks like a pretty ambiguous shift. What's happening to price? Well, I don't really know. OK? So that's not going to be the answer. OK? Ambiguous. If we were, however, to consider C, which seems like it has to be the answer choice, well, again, we have our supply-demand framework, supply curve, demand curve, and we have the price of hot dogs goes down. So the price of hot dogs goes down. What happens to demand for hot dogs? No, price of, so I'm doing the steps. So price of hot dogs goes down. More people buy hot dogs. Fewer people buy, yeah, fewer people buy hamburgers. So what happens to demand for hamburgers? It goes in, it shifts in, it decreases. So demand shifts to D prime. Now we have again this thing with the price of beef, which is going down, price of beef goes down, less expensive to produce hamburgers, production shifts. Supply curve shifts outwards to S prime. So again, we go from S D intersection to S prime D prime intersection. What happens to price? There's an unambiguous decrease in price. So clearly, the correct answer is C. Questions about this one? All good with this? 
Yes. It's good? Okay. All right, one more question and then we're done. Okay, so we're referring to figure five. Assume that the consumer has an income of 120 and currently optimizes at bundle A. When the price of marshmallows decreases to $6, which bundle will the optimizing consumer choose? So we get a lot of numbers in this question, but we don't actually need them, and here's why. We're told the consumer is currently consuming at A, which basically means that this is his budget constraint, and this is his indifference curve, right? And he's producing, given his budget constraint, he's producing where the indifference curve is tangent to the budget constraint, right? So now we're told that the price of marshmallows decreases to $6. So if the price of marshmallows decreases to $6, what happens to the budget constraint? Yeah, so it's going to move. So remember, how do we get the budget constraint? How do we get that line? How do we graph that line? We ask ourselves, if we have a certain amount of money, we have 120 bucks, and we spend all of our money on marshmallows, how many marshmallows could we consume? And that gives us the point on the y-axis. Then we change the question and we say, well, if we spend all our money on chocolate chips, how many chocolate chips could we buy? And that's how we find the other point. So in order to find these points, we need to know the price, right? Right? You need to know, like, if I have 120 bucks, how many chocolate chips can I buy? Well, how much do chocolate chips cost? If they cost five bucks, I could buy 120 divided by five. If they cost 10 bucks, I buy 120 divided by 10. Right? So the price is changing. So one point is going to be changing. Are both points here changing? No. Why not? Exactly. So this price isn't changing. So this point does not move. However, this point does move. Now, there's only two other budget constraints in this graph, and only one of them moves at only one point. So we don't have to do any math here. We just need to look at this graph and say, oh, hey, this budget constraint clearly does exactly what I wanted to do. It pivots so that it changes the y-intercept but not the x-intercept. And all I need to do now is say, well, where's the indifference curve tangent to that line? Only one option there, too. Where am I now? I'm at B. That's simple. What would point B represent? So B is basically where he's consuming here this amount of chocolate chips and this just a number of marshmallows. But it's not optimal, right? Because given the budget constraints that we have, that point on the indifference curve is not tangent. So it's not optimal for him to consume there. Because B gives this person a lower utility, right? Exactly. So that's why it's not a Are there any questions about this? Do you want me to go over the one of the externalities, the pollution again? I felt that that one wasn't clear. Yes. Um, okay. I can. I can. I. I, I thought about a better way of explaining it. Six minutes. He wants to get. You got yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you I didn't want to interrupt you, but no, no, no. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, so what is this saying? This is saying if This is what each firm pays to eliminate one unit, right? This firm pays 46. For this firm, um, eliminating one unit costs $46, right? So 
In this scenario, the next one, sorry. They are saying, okay, if the government wanted to reduce pollution from 16 to six units, okay? So in this scenario, because the government is not, char not charging anything, right? The government says, if you want to produce pollution, you have to pay me this much. But now the government is saying, produce all the pollution, I'm not charging you anything. So then they will produce 16 units, as in this table. But now the government says, well, no, I don't want you to be producing six units, right? I wa sorry, 16. I want you to be producing only six, right? So what happens? They will, be, they will be like, okay, I will try to reduce pollution, right? And the government says, I am going to charge them so they don't produce six units, right? So how does the government think about this, right? If the government charges 167, they will, they will, it is cheaper for firm A to not produce the first unit, for firm B to not produce the, the, the um, second unit, et cetera, et cetera, up to um, here, right? So how many units will be produced if they charge, a hun they, if they charge 167? Because what is this 167? Is that if you want to produce, you have to pay me. So the government is allowing them to produce, but they have to pay for it. So if the government charges 167, how many units will be produced? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Why? Because, they, because it's cheaper for them to produce those units than to pay for eliminating them, right? So the way I was solving the problem was backwards, right? Let's reduce, let's count the most expensive units, right? So they, they say like, okay, the eliminating those units, units is more expensive for me, so then I will, I'm going to pay the government so the government allows me to produce, to produce those units, right? So then what I do is like, these units is very expensive, they rather produce it. These units is very expensive, they rather produce it. This, et cetera, et cetera, and I count the six most expensive units, right? Which is this one, um, which is this one, oh my god, we, we finished them all. This one, this one, this one, this one, uh, this one, and this one, right? So I am left with what? If the government charges them 179, right, they will be like, oh, okay, i rather eliminate this unit, this unit, this unit, this unit, etc., right, right, and then after that, after 173, right, I am going to pay the government to produce those units, okay? So, the, so this, in this market, what they are going to say is like, okay, after this point, I'm going to produce the unit that cost me 180, right? That cost me 180 to eliminate, I'm going to produce it because it's cheaper for me to produce it and pay the government 179 than to eliminate it and pay 180. Is it clear now? Right? Okay, good. 